everyone. Welcome back to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to other people about their stories with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or VEDS, which I also have. This is Katie, your host, and today I have Matthew with me to talk about his story with VEDS. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story. Of course. Thank you for having me. And you were just diagnosed, I mean, right now we're at the very end of 2020 and you were diagnosed this year, right? Yeah, I was diagnosed, I think it was like July 31st of this year. And how did that come about? Yeah, so um, if I rewind about a year ago to May of 2019, I think it was, um, I had been referred to a genetic counselor here um, because of just sort of, you know, life lifelong problems with easy bruising and bleeding, some joint pain, that sort of thing. Um, I don't remember exactly the time what had prompted me to... Um, to sort of like look for answers, but eventually my primary care physician had referred me to a geneticist under like with the idea that it was potentially you know one of the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome uh, types. So at that first meeting with the geneticist, they I think they were looking for sort of like the classic or hypermobile signs of hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and so that. I mean, I didn't really know a lot about my family history at the time, so I didn't really go prepared. And at the same time, I think they were looking for something completely different. So that kind of ended with no real answers. Um, and then so the summer, I think, following that and leading into the fall of last year, so fall 2019, I just sort of had kind of like given up on looking for whatever was going on. But... Then I think it was in the fall of last year, fall 2019, I was applying for jobs for the academic, the academic job, job market, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I don't know if it was like a panic attack or, or something happened during that process. And then for about like a week after, I just kept having like really intense um, like pressure in my head, some stuff going on with my chest and everything just like didn't feel right, basically. Around the same time, I had experienced completely separate from this, like uh, some really sudden and intense sharp pains in my right leg, like in my shin. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was basically like a lot of me going back to the student health center here. And eventually, um, I think they they figured out, okay, there's something that's going on. So then I guess it was around February of 29, no, 2020. Um, I just was sort of looking, I don't know for what, on Google, and I came across the website for the VEDS movement. And suddenly, like, when I was reading the list of, of like, signs and symptoms of, of VEDS, I just, like, I mean, my jaw dropped, basically, just because some of the stuff on there, I mean, it was, like, so specific and so, I guess, like, it felt like to me, like, so unique, right? Like... Mm-hmm. Um, that I just, I remember thinking like, if this, if this isn't what it is, this has to be like the universe's biggest coincidence because all of the things are there. Like, um, I had at the ophthalmologist, um, they had noted, I think two years ago that my, uh, cornea in my left eye was uh, like, there was some thinning in one part and thickening in another part, um, so that was like something that actually came up, I think, either on the Vets Movement website or elsewhere. But um, that the was one of the conus. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, and so I remember thinking, like, huh, like <laughs> that's already in my like on my file. And then there were other things like you know receding gums, the facial features, really small ears, I think it was, or small nose, uh, small lips. That was another thing. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that jumped out to me was like um, it used to be. I think the older descriptions of VEDS said something like bulging eyes or something. So I think I always, like when I came across that, I just thought like, that's not me. But then on the VEDS movement website, I think it said like deep set eyes. And mm-hmm. immediately I thought like, yeah, that's definitely me. But then I think really <laughs> the one that really just convinced me was the detail about like falling asleep with your eyes partially open or opened. And I mean, ever since I was a kid, like through adulthood, I mean, that's what people have have told me, that I've slept with my eyes open. So kind of when I presented all of these little things to my primary care physician, and I said, I think that I need to be evaluated for this. 
And immediately she said, yeah, absolutely. So she put in a, a referral to the uh, Heart and Vascular Center here at UVA. So that was in February. Eventually, you know, I didn't have my first meeting with them until June, I think, because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's when they did, like, we, we got to, like, revisit my family history at that point, adjust some of the things like, um, like, I do have hypermobility that was not really tested the first time. Uh, so they adjusted that. So from that conversation, they decided that it was worth um, doing the genetic testing. Um, and then I think I got the results. That was like maybe late June and I got the results July 31st. So and how it, did all of this feel? Because that just sounds like a whole lot of confusing time, you know? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, this, I mean, so I'm 36, right? And so I remember even even in high school, um, like asking the family doctor or in college, you know, asking every now and then, like if I had a doctor's appointment, like I would bring it up because I just was so frustrated by how easily my skin broke, you know? And so it was just sort of like a lifetime of being told like, oh no, you just have thin skin was the response that I always got. Um, and there was a little back and forth at one point. Someone said, no, that's not a thing. Another doctor followed up another time and said, yes, that is a thing. But nobody ever thought it worth um, pursuing any further. Mm -hmm. So um, in a sense, it felt like, uh, I guess, re like reassuring. I don't know if that's the right word, but, but you know, like it confirmed that, okay, there is actually something going on and it's not just me, like thinking that I have, you know, thin skin. Um, I think the other thing was because I had the, the, the time from like February until June or February till July, really, to, to sort of process that information, I think helped in a way because, I mean, I went through all of the roller coasters of like seeing the most um, negative possible outcome. But basically, I think just that... Um, I had the opportunity to prepare myself and because I was like, I, because I was convinced, I mean, because the evidence was so overwhelmingly pointing towards VEDS, um, even when I went to that first appointment in June, the genetic counselor and cardiovascular doctor both kind of told me, you know, the majority of times when people come in here and they're like being tested for VEDS, it's, it's negative because, you know, there's a lot of, I guess they said like symptoms that people may have, but they, they might not have VEDS. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they were sort of more surprised at the results than I was um, simply because, I mean, I had, again, I had like almost half a year at that point to, to process. I, I was also like at the time I was, I was working from home, of course, because of the pandemic, but also because I was on my fellowship for the PhD. So it was a lot of sort of going through this process of, okay, you know, I, I more than likely have this. Um, and so I was like less shocked when they told me about it. And then when I, when I found out, I mean, I think, again, it was just sort of like confirmation that, that what I thought was there was actually there. Yeah. Did they ever loop back around and figure out what was going on that led you back to this? I know you said you were having like panic attacks and then pain in your in your leg that was sudden and sharp. Did that ever get an answer or did that just drift away? That never got like fully resolved. I know at the time I was told that the, the issues that I was experiencing with like the head and, and chest and stuff like that was probably just panic like a panic attack it i don't know i mean because it did feel like there was some residual like it was almost like aftershocks of it for about a week and a half or two weeks and i just didn't think that that kind of uh was consistent with necessarily having a panic attack but nobody thought that it was worth i mean they didn't see anything either in the scans that indicated anything um worrisome in that regard uh the thing on my leg i was told at the time that it was more than likely uh i think they said like peripheral neuropathy and they explained that, you know, basically every time the the skin is broken and has to sort of like heal itself and stuff like that, there's also nerve damage. And then over time, I guess that 
you know, nerves can either send no signals for pain or send false signals of pain. Um, and I mean, it kind of makes sense because that spot is um, had has like several layers of scars. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it was just like strictly related to that part of my leg just had been beat up so many times that it decided to <laughs> do its own thing. But you did get a scan after your diagnosis then. Yeah, as soon as I got the diagnosis, they scheduled some like a series of scans. And they did, I guess, like my head, neck, chest, legs, arms. So your whole body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, did you learn anything from that? I think since you weren't diagnosed until you were 36. Yeah, they found um, four dissections in my neck. Um, they said that they couldn't really determine how old they were, but um, they, I guess they were like pseudo aneurysms. Mm -hmm. I have one of those in my left, uh, internal carotid. Yeah. So, oh, okay. So yeah, I guess like my, my left and right internal carotid and then like the left and right, ver what is it? Vertebral. Mm -hmm. Um, there are dissections in all four of those. Do you remember feeling, I know you probably don't know when they happened, but do you remember any like thing that could have been? Yeah, if I think back, because like prior to being in grad school, I, I was like a restaurant, like a line cook in a restaurant for something like seven years. And so I remember my last job, um, like at least once, if not twice or multiple times, just kind of having really sudden and extreme neck pain and I just thought at the time because I mean that job is a lot of lifting a lot of bending a lot of you know you're kind of you're bent all day long pretty much you know mm -hmm. like either chopping stuff or, or whatever it is so I just thought it had to do with you know just strain that I was putting on my muscles and stuff but the the pain was just so bad that um, I couldn't like when I went to work I couldn't I really couldn't move my head at all so if like one of my buddies was talking to me on the left or the right or something, I would have to like turn my entire body to look at them. Um, but I mean, you know, I don't know if that's what it was, but that's the only, the only thing that I can think of as, as potentially, um, yeah. related to that. Yeah. Yeah. Mine felt very similar to that too. It was like when I had my left internal carotid dissection, it was at the time, I, it took a year and a half to figure out that's what was going on. But I remember not being able to turn my head like the pain was so severe. And I, you know, would joke around about it. But when it first happened, I remember my boss coming into my office because I'd gone into work for like an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember I was in like this, uh, like an office chair, you know. And so I just spun my whole office chair around <laughs> in order to look <laughs> at him because I, I could not turn my head at all. It was it was miserable. Yeah. So I wouldn't uh, be yeah. surprised. So are you the first in your family that has feds? Well, so after I got the diagnosis that, you know, they, they encouraged me to um, to have my whole family, or my immediate family at least, tested. Um, so my two brothers and my father tested negative, and then my mother tested positive. What was that like knowing that your mom has this too? I mean, it kind of, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. That was sort of like our special bond growing up, even when we didn't know that it was beds, you know. Um, like, she always would say, oh, Matthew, you and I have the, the Jackson skin. Like, so talking about, like, how her father and, and, and she also would just, I mean, skin just breaks so easily or have bruises, you know. Um, and we, like... We also used to bond, like, especially once I was, like, out of the house and stuff, a uh, strange bonding experience. But, you know, we would, we always had Band-Aids, of course, right? And so it was almost like comparing our injuries to see whose was the most ridiculous, kind of. <laughs> um, and so as soon as I found out that I had VEDS, you know, I thought, like, okay, I mean, it has to, like, it has to be mom. And if it's not mom, then that's even more of a strange coincidence. Yeah. Um, so I think when I found out, I was, you know, again, it kind of confirmed what she and I had known for a long time without having a name for it. But at the same time, you know, being being far away from, well, not far away from her, but I'm two hours away from her, but, you know, um, just not being there 
especially like in the middle of the pandemic, I just felt it, it, it feels very isolating in a sense. Um, but yeah, I don't know. At least, at least now she knows and she can have, you know, a support team and stuff like that. So I think in that sense, I'm glad that she got, she got the diagnosis as well. Yeah. You know, this brings up a, a question that I have is how did you guys process that information during the pandemic? Did you process yeah. that together? <laughs> Not like I, so the strange thing for me was that like really the, the timing of everything, like when I first found out about, or when I first saw the description for VEDS, it was, I think literally the week before everything. So this may have been like early March. I can't remember, but basically the week before everything shut down here in the U S mm-hmm. and so, you know, going through the whole, you know, social distancing thing or, um, everything else, it was just sort of like, it was almost an extension of a lot of the things that I had been doing for a long time. Like, um, so it was, for me, it was just this weird parallel in the sense that, you know, like, like even before the pandemic, if I go out in public, I just, I'm very protective of my space because, you know, how many times I've been just like bumped by a grocery cart, for instance, or something. And I know how, how bad that's going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. Um, so in a sense, it was just really strange because I had this like really personal thing going on that was almost like a, like not a perfect parallel, but it's like a, a strange kind of parallel to this more global thing with the pandemic. So it was, it was kind of strange to process that. Um, and then once, once we did get the results, I mean, again, I had had at that point so much time myself to process mm-hmm. um, that, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the only thing that made it challenging was just not being able to like see each other since, you know, like haven't been able to just like hug her, which has been hard Um, or even like go to visit her because like she was actually supposed to come up to Charlottesville for some uh, like some imaging. And, you know, like I think the concern for both of us, even though it's only a two hour trip, neither of us can make it the full two hours without having to stop somewhere. And that's unfortunate, you know, Mm-hmm. Um, especially right now. So it kind of means that she's stuck there and I'm stuck here. Yeah, that has to be so hard for her too, I would imagine, not being able to hug you. Yeah. She did say to me, like when I asked her recently, like what her thoughts were on, on having the diagnosis, you know, I mean, she sort of echoed kind of my sentiments about like, well, you know, if nothing else, it's just, at least I know it's not in my head, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's a valuable kind of feeling, I think, when you feel like everybody thinks it's in your head for so long. It's, right. It's kind of like this, for me, it was kind of a relief. Yeah. So do you know what kind of mutation you have? I know you're very new to this. Yeah, so I've, tried, like, I've watched a few videos and whatnot, and I've had some, some help from other people in the vets community to try and uh, decipher this, but I have, uh, glycine substitution and that's, Uh, that's kind of like all I know. Well, there's lots of, um, great doctors. Oh, there's a few really great doctors that really are very helpful to our community. And I'm sure that if you reached out to, um, to them or got connected with them, they could help you understand that too. Yeah. So you're, I know your mom is a little bit older given that you are Mm -hmm. 36 now. Um, I would imagine she has to be (laughs) at least a little bit older than that. Um, what does it feel like knowing that you have this glycine substitution, but also that your mom who also has this is doing all right. Is that the right way to say that? Yeah, I think that is, I think that is a, a, a good way to say that. I mean, I think the first thing I'll say is that I, appreciate her so much more like I mean the fact that she has done everything that she's done and all the while had this going on you know like and just knowing that I mean I don't know it's just like I I get really emotional thinking about like what could have happened so I'm really grateful that nothing did happen Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense um so I'm just like very 
happy that she is. I mean, she because she's retired now and she just lives her her life, you know, and that just makes me feel really good. Um, and at the same time, I think I it, it, sometimes I have to catch myself because you know I I am aware of the fact that like just because she's doing well at her age you know I may not have like that same uh, sort of outcome and you know my hope I mean because that's like what my care team has pointed out to me multiple times like that oh you know your mom is 70 and she's doing well um, you know so I appreciate that because it is it is reassuring but you know I also am aware that like we had vastly different lifestyles for instance um, you know, I, and I don't know how much that that plays into to vets, but uh, you know, I just have to be, I guess, cautious about drawing conclusions about my own future from my mom's experiences, if that makes sense. Um, and especially because I think, like, you know, her father, who again had like very similar symptoms and signs as us. Um, I mean, he passed away in his early fifties. And I mean, he, he like he had diabetes and and stuff like that. But um, you know, it's like that's something that's in the back of my mind too. Is that it's it's not as simple as it seems. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, truly, we don't know um, what makes a difference right now. Right. So I think that's a uh, it's it's an interesting kind of reflection on like what you gain from your family history with this, right? Right. So I want to go back to when you were a kid, because I know you've mentioned like always having band-aids in your skin, um, like splitting apart and things. How did you deal with that, like growing growing up? Or what was what was it like as a kid? Like I have so many memories of myself, like trying to walk on rocks and getting bruises on my feet or something silly. Um what was it like for you? Oh my gosh, yeah. So like, I was a really active kid, and so, you know, I mean, of course, I was always getting hurt. But I think in those early years, it was probably just, just, oh, he's, you know, he's out playing. Um, but uh, yeah, like, pretty much anything. Like you said, like, like bruises on the bottom of my feet was something that I experienced quite a bit. Uh, which, <laughs> like, I ran cross country and track in high school, so I don't know how I did that in retrospect because I mean, like. You know the the like I would always have kind of like bruises on the bottom of my feet from running, um, mm-hmm. and then you know playing soccer and stuff. Like I have, I mean, I have like scars all over my legs from that and my ankles. Um, <laughs> I I I don't know. It was just like constant, constant stuff. Like just walking. Like uh, I hated the fact that pretty much every few days. I was going to kick one of my, one of my feet, like one of my feet was going to kick the other foot and I knew it was going to break the skin. And so just always dealing with like little things like that was kind of, it's kind of annoying, but it also, again, because my mom was so used to dealing with it, I had that support from her and it was just sort of, I guess like I felt kind of special in that way. Um, And I mean, like if like I could say, one maybe not a catchphrase but something that my mom would like say to me frequently when I was growing up it would be something like like like, get a band-aid because she just knew you know (laughs) um and she just always had like um you know if I was going anywhere she would tell me to make sure I took band-aids so it was like it was just part of my my daily life growing up of just like of just having random bruises or being cut like um it was to the point where um i i think it was like it must have been like middle school or something and it was like gym class and i was in the locker room or something and i I like kind of one of my friends had his book bag on the ground and i bumped into it and it just like just the skin on my shin just like ripped you know Mm -hmm. and so i mean it was kind of messy and it was this big scene and so I just remember being called jokingly or not I don't know but like hemophiliac from from there Mm. like because 
it was so frequent that it happened. I mean, I went to a small school, but like it was so frequent that this would occur that I mean, that's like how people sort of saw some of the stuff that I was going through. Yeah, and as kids, you don't have another name for it. I mean, they don't know the word feds, right? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so interesting. And I wish that I had carried a Band-Aid more places. I never did. Like, I always had it in my truck. Like, when I was in high school and even now, I always have Band-Aids in my truck. But I always end up, like, I remember at work, a couple of times, like I've cut myself on something and I would put a paper towel on my arm and then like use some masking tape to wrap it all the way around, you know, cause I was in yep. the middle of work and I couldn't deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And ultimately yeah. <laughs> it was too big for a band aid anyway, but it's, it's just funny. It's just funny hearing the similarities. Yeah. I, I, I will have to confess that uh, more often than not, I would, I would forget the band-aids <laughs> and <laughs> then I would, then I would be reminded by something like, Oh, I should have brought the band-aids <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or like a full on pack of gauze. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you are like so new to this diagnosis. It's only been six months. Is there anything that would have helped you when you were going through all of this or anything that has helped you a lot since your diagnosis? Um, I mean, really just the, actually the support of the vets community, but then also just, you know, um, like support from my partner, from my family. Um, we actually got a dog, I think in, oh man, May, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So actually having, Having a dog has been actually really um, beneficial. Uh, she kind of takes my mind off of a lot of things. What kind of dog is it? She's a, um, let's see, I think she's like a lab hound mix. That's so cute. We had a yeah. had a hound, like it was a hound boxer mix. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that me and my ex-girlfriend had, and it was like, she was just the cutest. I imagine a lab Hound has to be super cute too. Yeah, <laughs> she's pretty cute. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you want to share with the community that I haven't asked? Um, I mean, I think what I would like to say is that the more awareness, I, I think the less, the less we'll hear of stories like, you know, finding out after so many tries, right? Like, because um, I think had it not been for the information on the VEDS movement website, I don't, I don't think I ever would have thought to look at, at VEDS. I mean, because every all of the literature before was just sort of very, um, very focused on certain characteristics and just missed a lot of other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and like one of the things that my genetic counselor sort of commented on when they when they did, um, you know, sh I guess like give me the diagnosis, she said that like basically th that I should credit myself with just being so um, unwilling to accept the answers that I had been given. And I think that's really, that's hard. Like it was a lot of, a lot of energy and a lot of work and a lot of just sort of um, emotional ups and downs and a lot of even just medical professionals asking along the way, like, what do you hope to get from this? Like, as if I were chasing some pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I think the reality is that, you know, it was, it's there, it's been there all along. I had been asking the right questions since I was a teenager, but nobody was willing to you know, to see that there was something there. Um, and I think just the more that this information, the more that these stories are out there, I think the more helpful it'll be to people who may not have had, because I mean, I didn't have any like um, major events prior to my diagnosis. And I think that's what also surprised the genetic counselor. Um, and I think my hope at least is that, you know, as people can get a diagnosis earlier, then hopefully lifestyle changes can help, you know, um, avoid some potential complications. Because I also think like, 
you know, had I not gone to grad school, had I just stayed working in the kitchen, I don't know what, you know, um, like if I'd be having this conversation right now or if I'd be here to have this conversation. And that's something that I think about a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So I think just awareness is so important. That's a really great point. And that what struck me and what you just said is that, you know, having to, what is it the genetic counselor said that it's, you know, to you that you did not accept the answers that you have been given. Right. And that to me just really struck a chord. And I think that's where our stories are very similar is that our first geneticist missed the diagnosis. Right. Did you end up um, calling that first geneticist and letting them know? Or I, I, you know, that's something that I've been debating because at first I had a lot of sort of not like resentment, but just like frustration because it just felt like that whole experience was so humiliating. I remember even when I came home, my partner, like from that first appointment, I mean, like that was one of the things that was so, uh, I don't want to say memorable from that experience, but that I was just, I felt so humiliated. And I mean, because they told me that I should go see a podiatrist, that was it, you know? Um, and I just felt so, yeah, humiliated because uh, everything that I had mentioned during that appointment, like all of my concerns were real concerns and none of them were even addressed, you know, about like the easy bruising and bleeding, about all of these other things. Um, some of the stuff was attributed to the fact that I had, you know, done a lot of hard work before like construction and, and um, restaurant work and so maybe that's when my legs and hands hurt or that sort of thing. Um, or because, you know, I did sports when I was younger, so of course my ankles are the way they are. Like, mm. it, it just, it just because I had gone into that saying up front, like, you know, I feel very, like, overlooked and, and not taken seriously because historically, every time I bring up these issues, doctor, doctors tell me that there's nothing there. And then to come out of that experience with that same sort of, feeling I think I mean like I was ready to give up I really was ready to give up and I mean fortunately and unfortunately you know I had some really like I said like kind of bizarre sort of like isolated events that made me think like huh maybe there's something going on mm -hmm. um, and then again finding the vets I mean the timing of it was also so important because you know in the time since that first genetic uh, first appointment with the geneticist like I think that's when the vets movement maybe started or appeared and that's when the information like I don't think the, the that information was available when I had gone into that first appointment. Yeah, you're right. It it wasn't um the vets movement started in October of 2019 and yeah. the website went up December of 2019. Wow. Yeah. So I mean that I mean that made such a difference because even like when I went to the geneticist the second time they they told me specifically about the vets movement website and i said i know <laughs> that's why i'm here <laughs> basically <laughs> that's yeah. great so yeah that's a very i understand it's a very personal decision on whether or not to call that doctor especially after feeling so humiliated but you know i do I, it it has uh, crossed my mind because I think, you know, I can reach out to them electronically through my, my system and, or my chart and whatever. Um, but I think like now that I have this sort of like separation and, and now that I've been able to sort of like digest the, the diagnosis, I think it is worth reaching out to say like, Hey, um, just so you know, mm -hmm. because I think that is an opportunity hopefully for them to learn that like, okay, when I'm, when I'm evaluating someone, you know, I need to approach, um, like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, not just from the lens of like the hypermobile type, but instead looking for these other features. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally a learning opportunity if they take it that way, which I right. hope that they do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really hope that they do. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Matthew. No, thank you. And I, I just, I really appreciate it. I know that you were diagnosed not very long ago and it's, on top of being a weird year in 2020 in general for everybody, uh, which is an understatement of the year, I think, having this on top of that 
it's just a totally extraordinary circumstance. And I just appreciate your willingness to put yourself out there. No, thank you for, thank you for doing this really. Well, I will um, see you soon. And thank you everybody for listening. This was Matthew sharing his story with Veds and this is Katie, your host. New episodes of Staying Connected come out on the last Sunday of every month. So if you are not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to this podcast to get notified when we have new episodes. And I'll see you soon.